Welcome to season two of Gray Maybe, a limited series podcast and social experiment based on this season's topic, the body. My name is Jillian Schmitz. I'm a professional dancer, actor, teacher, author, artist, and cat lover. Through my own personal journey of recovery, I've found that things aren't just black or white, or as simple as yes or no. For me, in my recovery, there has been mostly gray area and a lot of maybes. In most of my stories, you can find the gray maybe. I will be sharing my own process through personal stories, interviews, and hopefully stories from listeners in an effort to help lessen the stigma and shame of disordered eating, eating disorders, and body image. If you'd like to share your story of ED recovery on this podcast, anonymous or otherwise, please email graymaybestories at gmail.com. G-R-E-Y-M-A-Y-B-E-S-T-O-R-I-E-S at gmail.com. Before we get started, if you haven't already, please subscribe on whichever platform you're using to catch future episodes of Gray Maybe. A note before we begin. The topic of disordered eating, eating disorders, body dysmorphia, and other behavior related to the body may not be difficult for me to share anymore, but it wasn't always this way. I recognize and anticipate the possibility of judgment or disbelief about my experiences, ranging from my own family members to strangers, in addition to the potentiality of losing certain opportunities for publicizing my own experiences. My stories and the stories of others on this podcast are told through the lens of our own experience. The revelation of our process is ours to tell. If you disagree with the views or stories on this podcast, know that we are not speaking on anything other than our own experiences and viewpoints. Take what you like and leave the rest. Nothing expressed or mentioned in this podcast is an endorsement or is meant to be taken as suggestion or advice. It is strictly the sharing of our own experiences and recovery. Any feelings this podcast activates in the listener is for the listener to process and recover from. Any criticism you have based on these experiences and choices are yours, and they are not anyone else's burden to carry. Trigger warning. Dieting, weight gain and loss, fat phobia, eating disorders, disordered eating, body dysmorphia, and gastric sleeve surgery. Okay, today on the podcast, I have um, a friend of mine for everybody to meet and hear from. This is my friend, Dave, my friend Dave, I'm having on the podcast today, and I'm excited for everyone to hear about his story. I originally met Dave in what we call in uh, recovery rooms or 12-step rooms in the rooms. I met him in a program called OA, which stands for Overeaters Anonymous, which I'm, I'm sure you've heard me mention. And um, and just uh, a little note for Overeaters Anonymous, because I always like to say this when I talk about Overeaters Anonymous, I don't classify myself as an overeater. However, this program is all inclusive to all things weird with food or body dysmorphia stuff. So I met Dave in those rooms uh, quite a few years ago, and we have continued to be friends um, even when we weren't seeing each other at meetings, even during a pandemic even post-pandemic, uh, we have remained friends. So I'm bringing Dave on the podcast today to talk about his journey. So Dave, welcome to Gray Maybe. Thank you. I'm so thrilled to be here. Uh, yeah, uh, I'm Dave. Uh, you told me to introduce myself. So yes. I'm I'm Dave. I am a uh, comedy writer, director, teacher, uh, not famous uh, enough that anybody's got to look me up. <laughs> Um, out in Los Angeles, um, where I'm just sort of working the grind, uh, day in and day out. And Dave and I have had so many really fun conversations. I can vouch for Dave. He is super funny. And, um, one thing I know about Dave is uh, this, okay, well, first of all, I'm just going to jump right in. So one of the things, there's a couple things that stick out in my mind of all the conversations we've had regarding this topic. And one was, and I know this answer, but I'm going to ask you and you're going to answer it. Dave, when was your first diet? Uh, my first diet was when I was six years old. Um, my I had had uh, Bell's palsy at five years old, which is a temporary condition that paralyzes half of your face. They put me on steroids. My parents 
uh, freaked out that their five-year-old was getting fat. And at six years old, I was put on a diet where uh, my parents told me I would get a video game for every six pounds I lost. Uh, so I don't know how much weight I actually lost, but I know I lost at least 12 pounds because I got two video games. When you first told me that, like my heart broke. I can't, like, and if you're listening to this right now and your heart doesn't break a little, shame on you. No, I, it, there might be something wrong with you because, I, I, because that is like, if you see a six-year-old, you know, you see a six-year-old out and that kid's on a diet. Like I, I can't, I just can't imagine. Um, I, I remember that. And that's always stood out in my head about you as, as when I found that out about you. Um, so I just want to keep going from there. So at, you go on your first diet at six because you had this thing happen to you and the steroids had some side effects. Um, how did that kind of unravel going forward? Like, what was your relationship to food? What was your relationship to diet, body image, you know, as you grew up? Yeah, I mean, I was, you know, it just meant that, like, I think I think I'm a little unique, not unique, but like among men, I hear women having had this experience a lot, but I, I don't know a lot of men who have been gone through it. Um, I was on constant diets. Um, one of the things I always say is that um, I lost between 15 and 20% of my body weight three times before I hit puberty. Uh, I went on a second diet when I was about 10. And that was the one where my parents told me the whole family would get to go to Disneyland if I lost 10 pounds and that my brother needed to be uh, one of the people who watched me eat. So I would have issues where I'd be eating dinner and my brother would, you know, grab food off my plate and stuff. You had a supervisor. You had a right. supervisor. It was my little or... brother. It was my little brother, by the way, which is really even better. Yeah. Um, at 14, uh, I went on a crash diet my freshman year in high school where I did not eat breakfast or lunch, uh, came home, ate a sleeve of saltine crackers and then ate dinner that night and then didn't eat anything. And I lost about, I remember losing about 25 pounds and man, everybody told me how great I looked. Um, so, you know, um, I grew up with terrible body image, you know, like, uh, Every time the weight came back on, it was an issue. My parents involved everybody in our world around it. You know, one of the things I, I always said was like, if you love me, you've told me I'm fat. Like that was part of the experience. Like if you love me, at some point you have gotten involved in my weight and told me that I was fat and that it was a problem. Um, and it never worked. You know, I would lose weight and then put weight back on, lose weight and put weight back on. Um, my belief, and I don't want to get ahead of everything here, but my belief is, is that metabolically, um, beyond psychologically, metabolically, what happened was I was convincing my body that I was living in a state of constant famine. So when I wasn't actively dieting, it was incredibly hard to not put on weight. My body just was like, okay, well, I need to, I need to store all this and get you to eat as much as you can. Um, so I want to interject one small part right there that you're bringing that up because I also believe that that's a thing and not just for, um, people that would be classified as larger bodied or quote unquote fat, because I have noticed for me, and I mean, you got to take this with a grain of salt because I am extremely body dysmorphic, but when I'm in a starvation state in a high stress state, I hold on to every single calorie I consume. Like it's almost like anything I I could eat a salad and my body's just like going to hoard it. Like I can't, it's like there is no movement. And I've seen that throughout time and space with my body. And um, so I, I completely relate to that. And I completely also like emotionally relate to that. Like what that, like what the feeling is of denying yourself, denying yourself, denying yourself, and then finally having that thing. It, it even emotionally feels um, like active um, starvation or like, I don't know, I, I'm having a hard time, like really, uh, expressing what that is emotionally, but it feels the same way. Sorry. Go on, go on. No, that's okay. I just, uh, so, you know, my experience was always being the fat kid, you know, like, um, I just believed that I was fat all the way through, uh, grade school and, and middle school and high school and, you know, even into adulthood. Um, and, it also was the source of all my problems. Like, you know, if, 
if there were things that were going wrong for me, it was always because I was not in control of my weight. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because like, I look at old pictures of myself now and I'm like, okay, like that's not the thinnest kid in the class, but like, that's not some like little, you know, I look at these pictures and like, he's not like this, you know, fat kid who can't move or anything like that. I was really active. I played sports. I rode a bike. Like, you know, I was, I was a little chubby, you know, which is a normal place for a kid to be. But at the time I just hated myself for it. Like, really saw it as a huge personality, you know, character flaw. I know how sensitive I was about my body image. And that was like so much um, less uh, in the forefront of people around me. Like I was seeing how people felt about certain things and I was deriving my own conclusions, but I didn't have people directly telling me anything like that because that wasn't my body situation. So I cannot imagine like how, how hard that would have been for me to hear anything like that. Like the few times in my life that I've been told that I need to lose weight or look a certain way or this, that, or the other, it's been, you know, so hard to hear. And it does send me into a very specific tailspin. Um, I just can't imagine um, having gone through that with having the little brother watching you and like, oh, we can't go to a vacation unless you do this. Like so much of it, like, um, yeah, I, my heart breaks hearing that kind of stuff. Um, so all of that growing up, looking back on it now, because, um, I'm not sure if I'm at liberty to say you are a father now. Yeah. So this is kind of off the way path, but I do want to bring it back because the the thing about also bringing you on is that uh, I find you to have a very unique experience in this realm. And I'm finding that a lot of the guests I'm having this season are very unique in their realm. Um, And we'll get to why I think you're extra unique um, other than just being my friend, Dave, who's unique and special and amazing. Um, But you are a father. So how has the how do you think the experience of your upbringing might have changed the way you parent your child? Or d- was there a difference? You know, did did you take different things? Because I've heard you talk a little bit and I've always been like really um, amazed at what how you've chosen to do things. It seems a little differently. Well, I mean, first of all, off, um, you know, I've come to, and I did, I, I, I have to say like, you know, I was, I was always kind of overweight too fat and I, I did eventually become pretty fat. Um, so I've really sort of like held on to this idea of that I've sort of learned over the years and sort of researching all this and stuff like that, that like your weight is just not really in your control that much. Um, very few people can do much about it. I don't want to get into the statistics because I don't know which ones are completely accurate, but they basically say that it's almost impossible to change your body type. Um, and in my upbringing, my family, the thing that they didn't do was they didn't provide different food for me. You know, I was expected to sit around with the rest of the family and eat the same food as everybody else did. And my mom made a lot of like meat and potatoes and meat and rice with like a gross vegetable on the side because she wasn't a great cook. Um, and we didn't really eat vegetables and she didn't try to make us, you know, give us vegetables we would eat, uh, or fruits and stuff like that. We had cookies and, you know, full sugar soda and all that kind of stuff in the house. So what I've tried to do with my kid is make sure that she is fed. She does not, you know, is not told you can't eat that. Don't eat that. Um, but that I have stuff in the house that she can eat and I try to serve her things that are better than the stuff my parents gave me. You know, I try, I try to make sure that like I, I introduce choices, but if she doesn't want to eat it, that's fine too. Like it's, it's going to be her journey with how this goes. Um, I will not put her on a diet. I've told her that diets are bad and they just cause you to put on weight and that her body is beautiful. And, uh, she's, you know, in my opinion, she's doing great right now. You know, like she's like any kid, she'd rather eat candy than anything else. And so, you know, we do sometimes have to be like, okay, let's put the candy away. Uh, we're having dinner. Like we're not eating, we're not eating a bag of m ms before dinner. Um, <laughs> but I'm also just trying to get her to explore fruits and vegetables and other cultures, food. And she's trying to cook and, you know, uh, she's learning how to cook with me and, you know, just get her understanding food better so she can make her own choices. Because the truth of the matter is like, 
I just don't think it's that much in any of our control how our bodies wind up looking. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I mean that's that's what I try to do. And then you also gave me that book on intuitive eating, and I it's hard for me to commit to it a hundred percent. It's hard yeah, for me to yeah. literally put like you know, hey, you want to eat mayonnaise and chip sandwiches and and bags of M and M's? Go for it. It's hard for me to get to the point where I'm like, let's just do whatever you want. So I haven't filled the house with any of the junk food she wants. But I really have right. – it, it's really made me been like, okay, if she wants to eat a bunch of chips right now, like, she can eat a bunch of chips. Like, I'm not going to jump in and, and be like, what are you doing? You're ruining your body or anything like that. Right. Um, I just try to make sure that there's other food around uh, that she can eat. And it, I have to say I'm super thrilled and proud of my – I have a 10-year-old who, you know, enjoys vegetables and Asian food and spicy stuff. And, you know, we were just hanging out with some family and the kids are like – what do you mean you eat that? And they're just eating cereal and chips and, you know, she's like adventurous and tries new <laughs> foods and I'm very proud of that. So yeah. That's so good. I'm so glad you brought up intuitive eating. Um, I had a friend like very recently like ask me for advice about her kid, you know, eating. And I was like, oh my God, Usually no one asks a childless person for advice on parenting. This is so weird and I feel like it's a setup. But she was serious because um, I have this issue with food. I And that came a lot from one of the few things for me growing up that I could control was food. Food and going to the restroom. Those are two things a kid can always control and they because they don't have a lot of control, right? They really don't. That's kind of the two things within their own experience that they can control. And one thing that you and I both have in common was someone was trying to control us or I saw it as my way of enforcing, taking back my autonomy. So, you know, even though my parents weren't forcing me on a diet, I was using that as my autonomy to control and you were being controlled and, oh, you know, like, well, we can't do this if you don't do this and you need to do this and take away that. Um, and so I do find that that is super harmful to kids, I think, you know, and I, I think it's a really, it's a hard, I, I, I can't imagine how hard it is to like watch your kid do something that you would not prefer that you know is not super healthy or the best, but like have to sit back and be like, if I try to take control of this, it's going to make it way worse. Like letting them have that kind of freedom and having them experience the autonomy and then having boundaries. But I'm so glad you brought up intuitive eating because I read that book. It really resonated with me. I don't practice it 100% either, but it did change a lot of my ideas and a lot of my viewpoints with some really hardcore science. And I had recommended that book to you a while ago at a very pivotal moment. And I couldn't believe that you actually read it. And I did not expect you to. And um, if you would have told me to go fuck yourself, um, I would have been fine with that too, because you and I are in a program that's not supposed to give advice, even though I'm going to ask you for your advice a lot in this podcast. It's supposed to be mere suggestion and just a relaying of people's experience, which I do like and want to stick to. Um, but thank you for talking about your fathering experience, because I think that's something that people don't always think about. And all this food and body stuff, it starts really young sometimes. And I think it's important to just like have the antennas up about it. Um, so there's some stuff that you've shared with me over time and space that I have thought was so interesting, also heartbreaking, but that I felt was a perspective missing um, that people don't often hear. And I want you to share about what it was like living as a larger bodied person. And um, I want to make sure that, that well, let me tell listeners what I remember most when I asked you that question, because as a larger body person, um, well, I don't know, this is getting into the next part. So I am going to get into the next part. You had a very... Um, life-changing surgery. Yeah. I had uh, gastric so, sleeve surgery. And when did you have the surgery? Uh, October of 2020. 2020, October. Um, so, and so you, and you had the surgery and we'll go back in more in depth of that. And then how much, like just for, uh, I, I ask weights not to like for everyone to get obsessed with body weights, but just so that there's 
a marker of like what you were and what you are so people can get an idea of like body shape? Yeah, I mean, I was at uh, 3.45 on the day I had surgery, uh, and I am currently around 2.35. Okay, um, so that's a significant amount of weight. Yeah, yeah. I lost 110 pounds. I lost more than that, but you, you get sort of to a bottom and put a little bit of weight back on because your muscles atrophy during the experience, and it's very intense. So, um, And it's, yeah. Um, so I had asked you post-surgery when I saw you finally because you got the surgery during the pandemic and so I didn't see you for a long time I saw you like before the pandemic then I see you tell kind of when things kind of opened again and you looked completely different I would have walked by you on the street I would have never known who you were I knew that I had to look for someone looking different but I didn't know what that would look like and if it wasn't for you being like hey I would have been like I don't know who you are um and because that's how different you look and during that time we sat down, I asked you, I said, what's the biggest difference in being larger, in your experience of being larger bodied and being, you know, smaller, I don't know a better term, smaller, smaller bodied. And one of the things that you said was you said people are nicer to you now. Yeah. I mean, you know, this is, as somebody who's gone up and down in weight constantly throughout my life, um, you know, people know what they weigh in general. I have no idea. Like, I don't actually know what my normal body weight is because I've never maintained any spe any single weight for any period of time. I was always gaining or losing weight. Like, I was never static. Mm. Um, but I will say uh, I had two major weight losses in my life. Uh, one of them I did on my own uh, back in the early 2000s um, and then suffered several injuries afterwards and put a bunch of weight back on and eventually rebounded to higher than I started out at. And then I've had this surgery. Um in both cases, and in all the cases where I've lost weight, when I get down to what a normal, people would consider a normal weight, um, there's a lot of praise. Um, there's a lot more attention from people. Um, uh, I worked for a talk show, which I'm legally not supposed to talk about which specific talk show it was, but it was a reasonably famous talk show that dealt with weight issues uh, back in the early 2000s. And I went from being kind of a professional pariah to literally sitting in our meetings with senior producers and, uh, and um, you know, getting people really excited to work with me and stuff like that because uh, I lost about 100 pounds at that time. Um, and all of a sudden, my work prospects uh, took off. I got hired by a theater that I'd been wanting to get hired by for years when I went in and asked them. They asked me, what's it like to lose 100 pounds? I said, well, I don't think you would have hired me if I hadn't. And they were like, yeah, you're probably right. Um, literally straight out. We probably wouldn't have hired you if you hadn't lost all that weight. Um, losing weight in the way it changes the way people treat you and perceive you. I mean, you know, I can't, I can't tell you how every complaint I've ever had uh, growing up was met with, well, you should lose some weight. You know, if I had acne... I had, an, I had a rash on my leg. It's probably because you're too fat and you're sweating and you're rubbing against your, your shorts. Uh, my feet were cold one morning. And my grand, I remember my grandma being like, well, you need to lose weight or, so you have better circulation. Um, there was almost nothing I could tell somebody that wouldn't start with like, well, lose weight and then we'll see what happens. Um, and just that treatment, you know, the way people treat you when you've lost a bunch of weight. Uh, first off is like you've accomplished something amazing. Um, and second of all, you just, it's very strange to just like, I, I don't know, like it's, it's strange to walk around the world and not have that response. Like you, it's like taking aspirin for a headache. You don't notice anything's happening, but the, the headache is gone. Like mm -hmm. when I've lost weight and managed to keep it off for a while, I just don't get treated like a fat person walking around. Like there's just a level of that that's gone and people are nicer to me and I, I can't totally describe it, but like things go better. People are nicer, you know, um, it's, it's a whole thing. And, um, it's, you know, it's at times it's kind of disheartening because it's like, Oh, I'm still the exact same person though. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, it, it's real. And, and this is why I, I very much like I had the surgery for health reasons, but I very much, you know, am, really big on, you know, uh, fat acceptance and, um, you know, like getting over 
judging people by their bodies because it's just, you know, it's ridiculous. And the amount of, I mean, I've had people threaten to kick my ass who don't know me. Like I had people threaten to fight me literally because I would get out of an elevator and I would be fat and they would, you know, scream at me on, you know, about my weight. You know, I've, I've gotten, I've gotten people confronting me about my weight in any number of places in my life. Uh, literally strangers, um, confronting me about it. Um, so just not having that changes everything. Cause there's not that anxiety of like, am I allowed in this space? Are people going to attack me? Mm-hmm. And then there's just also simple stuff. Like I couldn't shop at regular, at regular clothing stores. Um, I went and did a thing today, which was like uh, indoor skydiving where they have the big fan uh, and my weight is low enough that I can do it. But, you know, two years ago, I would never even be able to consider it. So a lot of the world's closed to you, too, when you're bigger, you know, like. um, So there's just a whole Mm -hmm. it's just a whole different thing. I mean, it's it's sad and it's hard not to be kind of resentful about it sometimes, but it's true. Like people are just generally nicer. There's more opportunities. There's more things I can do and participate in. I do not blame you for being resentful (laughs) at all. Um, I know you've shared some of that stuff with me before and you talked about airplane stuff and, you know, that extra headache. And, um, it's like, just seems like a ton of microaggressions all the time that um, I have not experienced. And most people who would be um, smaller bodies or I don't want to say normal, but like whatever that is, you know, like, and um, I, I just don't, I don't experience it much like I don't experience racism because I'm not, because I'm white. I don't experience the lack of you know, uh, or the, not the lack of, I don't experience those things because I'm white. Just like I don't experience the things you're talking about because my body is a quote unquote acceptable size, regardless of how I feel about it, how I've experienced it, what I think about it, how, you know, like how messed up in my head about it I am. I do know that I'm not in that same scenario and that I'm not experiencing those same things. Um, so I, and that's one of the reasons why I think your experience is super valuable um, because uh, I think that as far as um, disordered eating, eating disorders, body dysmorphia, body image, all that stuff, when it comes to the disorder of it, I think people have a very specific idea of what that is and a very specific category of where people fit um, because I've been around you quite a bit and I've listened to you and I find you to be an extremely brutally honest person, not just about just how things are going around you, but like for yourself too. And I think we've talked about this off and on a lot. Like, do you think you have an eating disorder or disordered eating or body dysmorphia? Like, or do you think this is like the lifelong, what has happened because you were kind of um, like your whole system was kind of screwed with and hijacked so young. It's I mean, I know there's no way to really know. Right. I think, I, I definitely think I have body dysmorphia. Um, at no point, point of my journey was I ever able to really like look at myself and have any idea what I looked like. The, you know, it was one of these things where like, I would look at myself in the mirror and be like, I don't look so bad. And then I would look at a picture of myself and be like, I am the most disgusting human being, you know, nobody should even want to look at me. Um, you know, that went back and forth. There were definitely moments back in high school and stuff where I would look at myself in the mirror and like, you know, physically like hit myself and, you know, really just hate myself for it. Um, when it comes to eating disorder, that becomes a little trickier because I think everybody just assumes that like obesity or, you know, being fat has everything to do with, um, eating garbage food and, and having an eating disorder. Um, and again, we haven't really opened too much into the surgery and stuff. And I, I, I want to get into why I had it too, but like, yeah, the re the thing that's been amazing about having the surgery is just first off, when I went to the doctor's office, they give you a very specific plan of what you should eat. And I was like, that's kind of what I'm eating already. Like this doesn't feel yeah, right. You're like this is the magic. Like, <laughs> right. But I was like, this doesn't feel right. Like I shouldn't be eating this food. Cause 
I already eat I already eat a lot of this food. And what I realized I I believe is that biologically the process of losing weight so many times and then regaining it caused my body to um shudder the hormones that allow you to feel full. And so, you know, there's a lot of work and a lot of stuff when you read about this, you know, the difference, but one of the things I read was that uh, people gain an average of one pound a year after the, after like the age of 25 or something like that. The difference between gaining that one pound and not is 11 calories a day, right? There's no way anybody can track 11 calories a day, no matter how close you're, you're tracking it. Which means to gain Unless like you, you've got a situation that's right. like kind of that's kind of a red light. That's <laughs> kind of a blinking sign if you're like, no, 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 I could because I'm like, oh yeah, no, no, I could. <laughs> but but Back I mean, the, the, day. the thing is, the reality is, even if you thought you could, like, there might yes. be a little more fat or a little more sugar on that piece of food, and that changes the calories just a little bit. The, right. The you can you can gain ten calories. Uh, or 10 pounds a that means you can you can gain 10 pounds a year by eating an extra 110 calories that's not a candy bar that's not one candy bar yeah. that's half a candy bar yeah yeah that's yeah. an extra piece of chicken and right. i truly believe that i just didn't get full as fast you know that i just mm -hmm. didn't do that and one of the things about the surgery is it's not that it changes the size of my stomach i didn't have a bypass it just had one where they they changed the size of your stomach it changes the way your hormones react to to being full and so one of the things when you talk about disordered eating is Tonight, for example, I had a piece, I had a chicken wing and, uh, and some brown rice for dinner because I had that in the, in the kitchen and I went and had that about an hour ago before I did this. And I felt pretty full after I had that. And as soon as I ate that, my butt and felt full, my brain started going, Oh, you fat piece of shit. What are you doing? You're eating too much. You're out of control. The feeling of being full to me is a sign of my own failure, but I didn't eat a ton of food. I didn't eat a ton of calories for dinner. It was, and it was, you know, it was a fried chicken. It was, it was a, it was a roasted chicken wing and, and some rice. Um, and I know that before the surgery, it took me a lot more to feel full, it just took me a lot more to feel full. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that that's disordered eating, you know, uh, and I've, I've met so many people who have like truly disordered eating. Um, and I, mm -hmm. I don't want to put myself in that category because it wasn't compulsive. It was just always a little bit too much. Um, and I don't think it was too much based on my biological sig signals. I think it was a little too much based on reality and stuff like that. But like biologically, I think my body was going, no, 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 eat more. I mean, I almost always stopped eating when I was still hungry. Mm. I, I never, I yeah. rarely got full. Like I always sort of like was like, that's definitely going to be enough food. I don't need to eat anymore, even if I was hungry. Um, and I think that's a biological response. And I think that's a thing that we don't realize for a lot of overweight people and fat people is that like, to lose weight means to be hungry all the time. To maintain weight means to be hungry for all the time for mm -hmm. people like that. And I don't think most people understand what it's like mm -hmm. to actually like have everybody expect you to be hungry all of the time and like think that they're doing the same mm -hmm. thing, you know? Um, cause there's, mm -hmm. I don't, you know, it's, it's just been so mind blowing. And I've talked to a few other people at the surgery and it is mind blowing for all of us to be like, Oh wait, I ate a normal amount of food and I felt, good after that and i didn't want to eat any more food that's so weird to me and i always thought that was a character flaw but now i realize there's a lot of people for whom this is just an acceptable amount of food and it wasn't for me before i think that's really um an important experience to share i'm glad you're sharing it um there's something that i've noticed very uh this is like really subtle um but it's like a realization i've had quite like like just recently, um, well, n number one, uh, I relate to that, uh, to what you're saying, because in a, in a slightly different way, like I would starve myself and wait to eat for so long that then when I would eat, I couldn't like, I was still eating after I was full because I just felt so, um, what I could call now, restricted or like um um not satiated like from going for so long of not having satiation to then doing it it's almost like i would overdo it and then that feeling of fullness i would have um i wouldn't even have it it wasn't even quite dialogue yet it was like the feeling of guilt and the feeling of shame 
would like just be right there to the point where it was like, um, even early in my recovery and even now every once in a while, if I overeat, which happens sometimes, like that guilt and that shame comes in and it's like, I want to throw up. Like, and that wasn't even uh, one of my behaviors. I was not a, a bulimic or engaged in purging stuff. But like, even now I'll like kind of like feel it every once in a while where it comes in. But that's not even the most recent. One of the most recent things I noticed is if I don't eat enough during the day and I am, you know, pretty good about what I call my sobriety in the program now, which is like eating two to three meals a day, not, not skipping meals. Sometimes if I get a late start or something, I'm really gentle with how I do this, but it's certainly better than not starving all day and then like going crazy at night. Um, but if I don't eat enough during the day, like if I haven't had big enough meals or for my output and by the later meal at night, I will be full. I will feel full, but my tastes want more. It's, and it's the same type of thing. It's like this, like the restriction of the pleasure of eating has not been used up and is like screaming for more. Like my tongue wants more experience, but my stomach is still full. And I find that to be such a weird sensation because it doesn't make sense. It's supposed to just be full. Your stomach is full. You're satiated. But my mouth, the pleasure seeking in it is still like, no, 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 that wasn't enough for today. Like you didn't hit all of the, we didn't have our fun today. And so we still want what we want. And it's like a really, I I couldn't put my finger on it for the longest time, but that's what I've come to recently. And it's, um, I've come to find it. And when I see it, I'm like, okay, so that I didn't eat enough today. I didn't eat enough today because for me, that's, that's how it shows up is in that feeling of like my taste buds still want more. Um, because usually I don't have, I don't, I, I can feel full and I can be fine with a, you know, a, a reasonable portion of food. Um, but I think, um, it's so crazy because I think you and I have such different experiences, but I feel like we relate on so many, or at least I feel very, I feel like I relate to you a lot. You might be like, "Mm, not so much. I know you've sat across me before and I'm like, I just, I can't, I feel it's just, I'm, and I know you've looked at me and I know you have like looked at me and been like, that's such a trip. (laughs) That is such a trip that you look that way, but you feel that way. Like that's a trip. And you've never been like, that's nuts. But you have looked at me a little strangely, but at the same time, been like, I get it though. Like that's, that's how you roll. Like that's, it's, I get it. Um, Yeah. I I just, I know I, I, it's such an interesting like range of experiences. You know what I mean? And I I hear you when you say the thing about um, having the surgery was that in the beginning you can eat, I mean, I could eat very little food, right? I was eating 600 calories a day in the beginning, 700 calories and not by choice, Literally, like, that was the most food I could eat. And I remember having this very ex- strange experience after about a month of being like, I am completely full and I am so hungry. And it was because at uh, that point I was, like, on a severe calorie restriction. So yes. my body would be full and, like, I wouldn't be able to eat any more food. But I'd also feel this enormous hunger because my body was, like, literally starving to death for a few months. Um, yeah. You know, if I had been a – if this had happened to – a to me at, you know, my current weight, I would have gotten very, very sick after a few months. Like I would have been deeply, deeply malnourished. Um, but because I had so much weight, you know, I was able to get through this literal starvation period, but it, you know, it's crazy. And when you read more, there's, there's a book I read years ago. I wish I could remember the name of it, but, uh, it was about the science of starvation and, uh, how that relates to weight gain. And they talked about how, like when people are starving, they don't choose to eat their friends who died before them or rip the bark off trees and boil it. It seems delicious to them and they are, they cannot stop themselves from eating it. And I think that's the thing we don't really realize is that like our bodies are very like starvation is one of the ways our ancestors died the most often. So our bodies are very attuned to like, you're not getting enough food. You need more. And I will do whatever I have to do your brain to get you to have food. Um, One of the things that happened right before the surgery was I, they put you on a kind of a crash diet right before the surgery so that you lower the size of your uh, liver. So it makes the surgery easier. Um, And it's really small, really small amounts of food. It's 
you know, protein shake in the morning, a protein shake for lunch, and then four ounces of protein at like a chicken or a fish and uh, vegetables for dinner. And the first couple of days it was really hard. And then it was easy for about four, you know, for about seven or eight days. And then like the two or three days before I had the surgery, I found myself occasionally like having food in my mouth before I'd realized I'd put it in my hand and picked it up. Like I'd be making my daughter food. And all of a sudden oh, I'd be wow. like, what am I chewing on? And I'd realize that like I had oh without God. noticing it, put food in my mouth. Yeah. Um, yeah. And my body was just like, you're not in charge anymore. Like I'm going to start getting food for you oh, if you don't wow. do this. Yeah. Right. So I, I think it's hard to yeah, understand it talks, that. A, it talks a bit about that. Yeah. In intuitive eating too, it talks about like anything you make um, like um, taboo, like that you're not allowed to have, which would be like in the wild if we were not like way back in the day, like something was not available to us, then it immediately switches your brain into obsession about it. So if you're like, I'm never going to have chocolate again, like what your brain does is like scarcity of the thing that we want. Well, now we have to have it and we're going to spend every waking moment thinking about it because that's how you would survive if you were like, oh, there's no meat available. There's no wild animals available. What? There's no wild animals? We must find some. And, you know, like, so it was a way to kind of survive is how the brain works when it feels like there is scarcity around something, um, which I thought was like super interesting. I'm probably hacking the science of it to bits by trying to like paraphrase it but if you're interested I'll put um I'm going to put intuitive eating in the show notes and if you do figure out that book Dave about the science of uh, starvation or whatever then I'll link that in the show notes as well um do you want to talk a little bit about your journey to have the surgery and I just want to say and I probably sort of should have said this like way at the beginning maybe I'll put it in the uh preface um I nor you are advocating for anybody to have any kind of surgery, nor are we advocating for anyone to lose weight. These are strictly our own experiences. I do have a thing at the top of the show that says this, but I do want to reiterate that I think your point of view is valuable. I think your experience is valuable. I think everybody should hear it. Do I think everybody should do it? Do I? Am I like championing it? I'm championing it for you because it was your choice, but I definitely don't champion anything for anybody unless it's their choice and their situation and their unique situation and choice. Um, but would you like to share your journey in deciding to have that surgery? Yeah. Um, and I, let me just say at the top, yes, absolutely. Like, you know, I think it's very important to recognize that, uh, being fat, being overweight, being whatever body shape you are is totally fine. Um, and, uh, one of the, one of the things that has blown me away in this journey is discovering that for all the, all the, uh, condemnation we put on uh what we call what they call morbid obesity in america um the life expectancy difference from what i understand and again i'm not a scientist so somebody can look this up and i they could say i'm wrong uh but what i've seen is that the life expectancy difference between somebody who's morbidly obese and somebody who's six foot four or taller is about two years like being six foot four or taller is just about as bad for you as being morbidly obese not overweight not a little fat like morbidly obese like the people that we're like oh these people are costing so much money in the healthcare system being six foot four is almost as bad for you as that and you know we don't demonize people who are six foot four um we actually date them and make them statistically CEOs. you're saying that that kind of like yeah <laughs> that's yeah. kind of how statistically it lines up interesting yeah and so um, and so you know while there might be health issues, that's not true for everybody. It's not the case for everybody. They're healthy, fat people. And, you know, you, you do, your body is your body and you get to make decisions for what you want it to be. And like, are also maximizing your life and health is not necessarily the way people need to live. Like we're not all supposed to be the healthiest, longest living people in the world. Like there's a lot of different ways to live your life. So anyway, all that aside, uh, for me, uh, as you know, I struggled with weight for a long time. Um, I lost a bunch of weight several times, the last time being uh, in my late 20s. Uh, I lost a bunch of weight, and that's when I had this great entertainment job, and I met my wife, and then I got hurt again. I, I, I herniated a disc in my back and had surgery, uh, and then while rehabbing the back, I tore an ACL and had that. So over the course of the next five years, I was in physical therapy full-time, started putting on weight. Um yo-yoed up and down a little bit trying to manage it but slowly kept creeping up as is usually the case with this kind of thing um came to la 
uh, had a lot of stress uh, with being in LA with career, with all that kind of stuff, put on a little more weight um, and uh, started going to Overeaters Anonymous on the suggestion of a therapist uh, who I now look back at and I'm not sure I'm the biggest fan of hers, but uh, I went, I went to Overeaters Anonymous and got a lot out of it. I think it's a great program. I think all 12 step programs are wonderful and spiritual um, and really dedicated myself to in the beginning. I was like, this is for sure me, right? If I am fat, therefore I am an addicted eater and I needed this program. And I worked the program pretty strongly, uh, for a few years. Um, and I, I'm sure I saw you around at that time, but at, at a certain point I started getting kind of demoralized. Um, I wasn't losing very much weight. I was going through the program and it just didn't, it wasn't resonating with me. Uh, the 12 steps were in some ways, but it wasn't really working for my weight. Uh, I had a sponsor at the time who I remember at some point turning to me and was like, I don't understand what's going on. You you really should be doing a lot better than you're doing right now. But one of the reasons was I was not dieting. Like I was not going to diet. I, I'd been told dieting is bad, dieting is bad. So I was not going to diet. Um, I was going to try to eat, you know, eat better and figure out the program and, and trust the weight to come off. Um, and so over time, I just wound up starting to rebel against the idea because there are people in that program too who really are compulsive overeaters whether or not it's an eating disorder or whether or not i mean it's not whether or not it's an eating disorder there's a lot of different kinds of eating disorders but i also started realizing that there were there were fat people in those rooms who were really sad about being fat but it didn't sound like they were doing the same things as the people who were like clearly compulsively eating uh and not to tell anybody's story but you know there's people who come to these rooms and talk about you know getting off work on Friday night and locking themselves in their house with candy and sheet cakes and ordering pizzas and eating and throwing up and eating and throwing up and eating and throwing up and coming back to work on Monday, you know, and like nobody has seen any of that. And, you know, I also found that that program was really helping a lot of people who were normal weight, you know, uh, or mm -hmm. thin, you know? Um, so eventually I sort of got a little discouraged from it. And I think that's when you and I started connecting because <laughs> because I've, you felt the cynic in me <laughs> i found i found that i connect best to people in those rooms who are also cynical about whatever the program is in some ways uh, i do recall you uh, i i i recall meeting you in the rooms um it, it was always great to see guys in the rooms because um although the meeting you and i met at there was a pretty healthy amount of guys in those rooms um, but oftentimes when you, when it comes to eating disorders, I do feel like it's so female centered and so nor more normalized for females. Um, and so it's always like really great. And I think like, does there some extra courage when men are in the room, regardless of whatever their disorder or, um, addiction is or whatever. Um, uh, but I do recall like seeing you in the rooms and, 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 you know, everybody would be, you know, if you've been to a 12 step, you know, it's, you're pitching the program and usually people have been at any point in time have have what you call some recovery under your belt and people have got some good life experience and some, you know, inspiration. And then there was Dave. <laughs> and I think I recall you saying something along the lines of like, I mean, I think this is great for you guys, but like, it's not working for me and I just don't, I'm not really feeling it and I don't really get it. It's just not, I, I don't think it's for me. And it was just like, what it really is, is we joke about cynicism, but what it is really is honesty, right? In that moment, you're just being really, really fucking honest over and over again about feeling like you loved the connection that the program brought you with other people, but it just wasn't doing it wasn't giving you the promises you weren't having the you know things that the program was promising you weren't having uh you weren't experiencing the results of what you had come there for and um we talked about it a lot off and on and and you started kind of bringing it up and I was like dude I have no idea what your journey is I don't know the rules and I don't know what's best for you yeah one of the things I started noticing were that the fat people weren't getting thinner um, and so I would be the fattest person in the room or, you know, there would be a few of us and we just kept coming in and being frustrated and frustrated. And there were a couple of people in the program who would say like, oh, I lost a bunch of weight. There was enormous success among people who had like full on eating disorders, you know, like, uh, and, and that was really, really helping people. And I think, you know, some of that fat phobia honestly gets translated a little bit in OA because OA says, if your body weight is not your ideal body weight, you're a compulsive eater. And I don't know that that's true. 
I don't know that's true. In the same way, I don't think right. that I don't think that you have cirrhosis of the liver because you're an alcoholic. That's one cause of it. Right. But like, you can also just have right. cirrhosis of the liver. You know, I have a friend right. who's a who's a vegan and very thin, and he has insanely high uh, cholesterol. He's not a compulsive eater. He just has a cholesterol issue. Um, so let anyway, that be a lesson to all you vegans. Let that be a, a tale. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> it'd be it'd be way worse for him if he ate meat, though. Um, but so. <laughs> So, and I don't know if this is true or not. This is this is my my thing. But uh, as it was going on, I was getting more and more discouraged. I was having joint problems and, and problems with bone spurs in my heels. And I went to I went to a doctor to to get it sussed out. And he was like, Yeah, I mean, we could try a couple things, but you know, they're pretty bad. And like, if they get worse, you're you're probably gonna need surgery. And I was like, Well, what does the surgery entail? And he was like, We detach your Achilles tendon, we shave the bone down, you rehab that leg for a year. Then we do the same thing with the other leg because we can't do both legs at the same time. So I'm like, so I'd be rehabbing Achilles tendon, torn Achilles tendons for two years. And then I'd have two torn Achilles tendons from there on. And he's like, yeah, that's how that works. And I was like, what would happen if I had weight loss surgery? And he's like, oh, you know, that'd probably help. And so I went to another doctor and I asked about the weight loss surgery and the recovery time is a month. Um, but you're out of the hospital in a day. There's no physical therapy or rehab. It's just, you can't lift more than 10 pounds for a month. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And the food thing is drastic and it takes a while to get used to and to get, to get okay with. But the surgery itself, you know, I mean, after I had my surgery, I walked two miles about four days after the surgery. Um, so I was just like, Oh, I'm going to go do the surgery that takes less recovery time, leaves me less handicapped and has, uh, will help me with a lot of other issues. Plus this lifelong thing that I've been struggling with. Um, and I did it. Um, so far it's been pretty effective. Um, you know, uh, at first it's pretty awful, uh, in terms of the food. And then over time it, mm -hmm. it got, it gets better and better. I feel like I can eat a pretty normal amount of food right now, but I can't eat a, I can't, I can't go crazy. Um, but I basically decided to do it because the other surgery that was looming for me was much, much, much worse. Uh, and I also, you know, I have a daughter and I had, you know, my biggest fear was dying and earlier in my process, uh, I was having panic attacks uh, when she was really young at a night where she was mm -hmm. four years old and my wife was out of town for the weekend and I was eating something I felt like I shouldn't be eating and uh, had a uh, slam in the middle of my chest. Uh, my daughter was in bed and I was just like, I had this thought of like, am I having a heart attack? It turned out to be a panic attack, but I thought it was a heart attack. And I was like, if I die right now, she doesn't have a phone. Like, I think she was three or four years old. I was like, nobody's going to be here for two or three days. Like, she'll survive. She knows how to get water and food. But she might literally conceivably sit here with my dead body for three days. And that was the kind of thing that drove me into, like, I've got to sort of deal with this at the time. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know that I was, from what I know now, I don't think I was really at that much of a risk of a heart attack as much as I sort of believed I did. That sort of internalized fear that my, my fatness was going to kill me and stuff like that there wasn't really any indication that like I had severe heart problems or anything like that. Uh, it turned out to be more joint related and everything, but those kinds of things I was like, okay, I'm going to do this because there's a lot of different stuff going on. And you know, I'm, I'm happy I did it. And like, I think that there is, I think, I think being fat is a chronic biological condition. Uh, I don't think that there's a lot most people can do with exercise and diet. They can get healthier, but they can't like lose that weight. Um, and I'll be honest, like, it's just easier, you know, uh, and I, I feel, I feel guilt about it. Sometimes it's easier to get out of that fight socially and culturally, um, and not, not be, not be recognized as a fat person. Um, and it, it does, it, it you know, it's, it's, it's easier. Um, so I absolutely don't recommend it. And I, because I think it's everybody's individual choice. And I also hate that, some of the ways it makes my life better is just because I'm not the target of people's sort of prejudice against it now. You know, mm -hmm. uh, that part makes me feel kind of guilty sometimes. Yeah. Um, what would you say, or do you have any advice or suggestion um, if someone, and I know we're not like in the business of giving advice or suggestion, but if someone was listening to this podcast and they had been thinking about one of the various surgeries like what you had and they're, you know, a candidate for it, um, is there any kind of information that 
you would want them to have that maybe you learned or that you think they should know or any kind of like preface it that you'd want to give other than like, you know, it's very much your, I, your, your decision and do your research and all that stuff. But like, cause I remember having the conversation with you outside of the restaurant we used to go to and you were talking about your, your, the, your feet, the problem with your feet and what you were going to have to do to fix it. And I was I, I was blown away because I was like, that's so invasive and so much recovery. And like you and I have both had our ACL, which I didn't know till actually right today. Or maybe if you told me I didn't record it in my brain. But like that's such a, like having my ACL injury and surgery and recovery was so difficult and so hard, uh, you know, from the moment of having an injury to accepting an injury to following through with the surgery to then the recovery to then the kind of like weird ghost fear that lingers of like ever having something like that happen again or to that body part to have to go through something so invasive with your feet that really didn't seem like the, there was a way out. Like it just, it didn't see, it felt like a band aid over a problem that might not get better or would be, could be worse, could cause you more immobility for longer and stuff like that. Like I was blown away that that was going to be the cure for that. And I remember that was the first time you started talking about doing this surgery. But I digress back to what do you have any advice or suggestion for anybody who has been mulling this over is a candidate for this? Is there information you'd like to have them information for them you'd like to have? I mean, yeah, and I'll give you like, I'll look up a couple links that you can put on this because there's some good, really good articles. There's a New York right. Times article and stuff that really go over the science of this. Uh, the things I, the things that I think are really that really helped me were number one when I realized like this is not your weight is not your fault like it's not it's not something you did to yourself it's it's so driven by genetics and biology and stuff like that in ways that we don't understand um, and we don't I mean one thing is I've I've realized uh, they I've had two nutritionists from my weight loss doctor and they gave me exact opposite advice uh, nobody really knows what you're supposed to eat. Uh, nobody totally knows what, how it affects you. I mean, there's some general guidelines, you know, there's some stuff that we should avoid, uh, to be healthy, but in general, no one's really quite sure why some people are deal with stuff better than others. So my first advice is like, read some of the science behind this and understand that like, it is not your fault. Your weight is not your fault. A lot of the stigma is just societally based. People are super angry about it. I, again, I cannot tell you how angry people get whenever I say anything about like, well, it's not actually people's fault that they're fat and people are like, Oh no, I, you know, I drink a six pack a day and, a, and two milkshakes and eat at McDonald's, but I work out and like these fat assholes won't. Sorry. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to talk like that. I hope that didn't upset anybody. Um, I've already said too many swear words. So go ahead. Um, those guys are full of shit, right? Those people are full of shit and it, they get really mad. They get really mad. Um, so first educate yourself on this. Second, like if you're going to do a surgery, look into it. The other thing that I'm, I'm discovering, and I, I follow a bunch of doctors and stuff on this, there's some weight loss drugs that are coming out that are pretty amazing. Uh, they're diabetes drugs with a history of like being safe. Um, there's really a lot of positive motion in the industry in in that sort of field. Um, if somebody wants to do it, it's it's done a lot for me. I don't know how it's going to be long term. I don't know that I'll maintain my weight loss forever. Mm -hmm. I don't know that I haven't lost this weight temporarily, just like I had many times in the past, and that it will slowly come on back on. Um, I don't know that I won't, you know, have to make other choices or the weight loss drugs won't become an issue or something like that. It is a chronic condition, right? Weight, oh, being being obese, having, you know, they call it metabolic syndrome. It is a biological condition. So if somebody's looking into the, the, the weight loss surgery, know that it's not a magic pill. It's a chronic condition. That's going to be, you have to be maintained for a long time. Um, and that, um, you know, do the research about the science and, and find a doctor who's really good at this too. Like, you know, um, and find support. There's a lot of different groups that have support about this. I found a lot of groups on Facebook, you know, find people in this. Um, and also realize that people lie about this. This is sort of one of the biggest things. 
in OA, I started going to meetings on oh, Zoom. Oh, shit. He's calling it out. No, I was, I mean, I don't know if, I, I'm sure I told you this. I was going to meetings on Zoom. Yes, and you did. when I started deciding to have the surgery, I said, I'm thinking about having the surgery. And I had people in OA tell me, you haven't gotten your brain right, so you can't have the surgery because you'll put on the weight no matter what. It'll come back on. Mm. And I started going to the rooms, and people would be sharing about their weight loss. And then I would sh- I would share, I'm thinking about having weight loss surgery, and I'd get a private message. Hey, I don't ever want to tell anybody in these rooms about it because I'm worried about being judged, and people can be kind of judgmental about this. I had that surgery two years ago, or I had that surgery four years ago. And all of a sudden, I started discovering that a lot of these success stories – from getting their spiritual spot right, where actually people had also had surgery but didn't want to talk about it in mm. these non judgmental spaces because they were getting judged. Yeah. They were afraid of getting judged for it. So there's a lot of people who are very secretive about this. I'm telling you, the whole, I have, what I have, like, uh, okay, so I know for myself how secretive I was about all of it, even just how much of it lived in my head. I, and I found these room. I found the rooms to be of all of the twelve step programs, and I'm in a I'm in a few of them. I have found that OA is some of the most closed off. I, I'm not saying that you don't get to know people and people don't warm up. And I've made like a lot of really great friends in OA, but there is like a certain amount of like very secretive closed offness that just comes with body dysmorphia, eating disorders, disordered eating, uh, all of the isms that come along with it. It is kind of like, um, it's not, it's not a bug. It's a feature. Do you know what I'm saying? Like it's, it's kind of all inclusive and it says a lot about what the whole deal is surrounding it. And I want to go back to something you said about, you know, you had two different nutritionists and they said counteractive things. And I, it's such a trigger for me when I see people advising other people about whatever the latest fad in this or that or whatever they found works for them. I love it. I think it's great. And if you have, uh, you know, training and licensing and you have clients, that's fine. But I, I do really think that everybody is so different that that's, that's the crazy part, right? Like there is no one size fits all when it comes to food and exercise or just body type and like how you metabolize and what your trauma has and what your psychology has done and what your body has learned and what your uh, ethnic heritage is and what your people ate and what, you know, the food is now and what, like, there's just so many variables. I think it would be, it's like every single person has to have a fingerprint of what would be best for them. And to try to figure that out is really, really difficult. Um, and that's just to be their healthiest self for their body. That's not like, oh, find your fingerprint and everyone's going to be skinny or whatever that means to someone. Because as I, as you have said, and as I completely agree with, everybody's body is so different and it's meant to be different. And there's a lot of different body types and lineages, um, that are, that are, and they're supposed to be. I also have no idea what my body is supposed to be like. I don't know what my real body weight is. I don't know what my real body, like I think it's kind of what it is now because I'm not interjecting all the time and trying to manipulate it. But at the same time, like I have to remind myself to eat because my default when I'm anxious or my default to control is to not eat. So I still am in a little bit of a gray area as far as you know, what I, I really don't know, you know, and I, I relate to you when you said that as well, that you're like, I don't really know what I look like. I don't know what my weight should be because I've also fluctuated anywhere from 140 pounds before I had my knee surgery to trying to get to a hundred pounds and getting really fucking close. And I'm almost five, six. So like those, like it, that's, you know, that's yo-yo-y in its own way and its own uh, in its own way, shape and size. But, um, I'm glad you brought that up because I do think that that's like really specific what, what people need to do for themselves. And and it's really hard to figure out. And if you have been able to like not do anything and maintain some kind of like ideal body, like good for you, but, um, it's not a moral failing if you can't, or you haven't, or you're not, you know, like it's not, you're not morally failing. You're not bad. And I wish as a society and I hope as a society we can expand our idea of what health is 
and expand our acceptance of what that is because it's super still really narrow and it's not ideal and it's not inclusive. And when we as a progressive society are trying to include so many other types of people in different ways, shapes, and forms, like this is one of those things that needs to be addressed. Um, so, and I, I'm, I'm hoping from this episode too, that anyone who listens doesn't feel like it's an episode of, oh, um, if you're quote unquote overweight or a larger body person or a plus size or whatever those words are that you should lose weight. And also like, that, you know, if that's something that you need and want to do or you've considered and you it's your dream, like that you don't not do that as well. Like if that's if this surgery is something that people want to know about or have been contemplating, I also don't want them to shy away from it. Um, I just want people to obviously do what's best for themselves and accept themselves all over. Although I get it. That's a tall order because I've said it many times. Sometimes the best I can get on most days is tolerance for myself. I can't get to like, I certainly can't get to love, but tolerance is something like I can get to. Um, Is there any, again, recommendation or advice that you would give anyone who is, you know, maybe struggling with an eating disorder or has struggled with some of the things we've talked about today or recognizes anything in what we've talked about, do you have any direction for them? Oh God, I wish I, I wish I had really strong direction for anybody. I mean, again, I, I don't really know what to say for people with eating disorders because I, I don't know that I ever had like, you know, when I heard people with eating disorders, I don't know that I ever connected to it as like, oh yeah, that's also me. I think OA, by the way, is great if you legitimately have an eating disorder. Like if you are, if you are a, you know, binging and binging. A lot if you're restricting like crazy uh always really good for that i really do think it's good for that i saw a lot of success for that um i just think you know my biggest thing for people who are feeling guilt or shame about their weight and especially not not the type of people who are feeling guilt and shame about their weight because they're like oh my god i weighed 100 you know 20 pounds when i graduated high school and now i weigh 130 and you know what's wrong with me i'm talking about people you know who are you know, their doctors are saying things and they're, you know, and, and people comment about how fat they are, or their weight. I think it's really hard, but like, this is just an area where people are fucking wrong. Like most of the time about it. Uh, and it's really, really unfair and it's really, it's really tough. So like, try to find ways not to blame yourself, try to find ways not to get on yourself about it. And like, figure out what you actually need. You know, what do you actually need to be healthy? What do you actually need to be ha- happy? And it's tough. I mean, I, I have to say like, this keeps coming up in my head. So I'll, I'll throw it out because I'm sure I've mentioned this to you before. One of the hardest things about being in OA rooms, especially in LA would be to sit there and listen to a bunch of like very attractive model, uh, male and female <laughs> model, dancer, actors, uh. you know, and, and they're, they're successful and, you know, both genders, uh, male and female actors and, and who would come in and talk about their body and how gross they felt and realizing like this person would never touch my body, would never have a conversation with me, would never like, I would not be attractive enough for them outside this room to like associate with, you know, um, and that always that always really like kind of got to me, you know, there was, there were certain meetings I stopped going to because I was like, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a room full of people being like, Oh, my, you know, my, my lover is not into me and I'm worried that it's about my body. And I'm like, I literally would at many, many times in my life have sacrificed anything to get you to like come out and make out with me in the corner of a bar for five minutes. Um, (laughs) it would have, it would have validated my life. Um, so just realizing like this is a culture that's biased against fat people in some really, really shitty ways. And like, don't just educate yourself about the science behind this, but like educate yourself, like seek out things. There's a podcast I do want to, can I recommend another podcast in your show? Yes, uh, of course. There's yes. a podcast called maintenance phase, which is really great to listen to. Uh, and they talk specifically about diet culture and fat phobia and stuff like that. Um, like really start looking at this stuff because one of the things that's really, really awful about this is, as a group, um, fat people are the only people who, you know, like sociologically who actively discriminate against each other and don't like each other. Uh, and generally, uh, one of the things that it comes out with a lot of 
uh, fat people is that they're actually actively discriminated against by their families where uh, they don't have a source of safety at home or with their significant other or anybody that they're being criticized from all sides. So it is a tough place to be. So like for anybody who's struggling with this stuff, like my first thought is like, be super gentle, realize you are in an unfair society that is treating you unfairly about this. Get educated about the science behind this. Realize it's not your fault. Find the support you need and then make decisions you need to for your health and for your happiness. I think that- that's great advice. I am totally one of those people in those meetings that's like, I feel very large and I know that I'm not, but it was hard for me to claim my seat in those rooms because I did recognize, first of all, it was hard to go to an Overeaters Anonymous meeting because that's not my deal. I don't overeat for the most part, you know, uh, maybe a little bingy, like, but not super, like I didn't, you know, it's already, I have a hard time qualifying in all of my programs and all of my uh, situations. So it was, you know, that was nothing new, but it was especially hard because I did like feel even if the other other people weren't putting that on me, I was just like, I don't, you know, like, do I, should I be sitting here talking about what I, you know, it is. But what I did find is that like some of my best and longest like friends that I've made in OA were people who were larger bodied. And those were the people that I felt like I related to a lot, that we had similar things, even if they didn't make sense in the same way. Um, so that was surprising. And I actually learned a lot um, about people with other things, like because I'm not a larger body person, like people who would talk about their experience about it and also like that they were starving, that they were anorexic or that they were always starving or that they were trying to starve to like, you know, that I I know that sounds like now to me, that sounds, you know, very odd that of course that could be happening. But at the time, because I had such a narrow idea of what eating disorders were or disordered eating or, you know, all of the things. It was hard enough for me to fit, you know, to, to feel like I qualified, but I also had such narrow ideas of what the disorders and addictions could be surrounding all of the things and how even if people weren't participating in those things now, that they might have had something early on in their life that put them on that kind of trajectory, you know, and I, I feel like you know, you qualify in that respect. And there's other people I know that you and I both know that I also think that that really fits in that category. Nonetheless, I think your advice or your suggestion, quote unquote, is right on. And um, then I just have like one other question for you. Um, I feel like you have had always like so much, I found talking to you very comfortable. I feel like you've always had so much comfortability when I talk about my eating disorder stuff and when I've shared stuff with you. Um, and I want to know where you think, like, where did you learn to have that kind of comfortability or the ability to kind of like meet people where they are or hold space for them? Like, is that just a skill Dave has? Is that just like a personality thing? Or is there something you could attribute to that? I think I was just born with a good soul. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> uh, I agree. Let's just end it there. Uh, <laughs> That's it. No, but I, I mean, I, I will say like, it's it's probably in some way the same reason I'm in comedy. Um, yeah. When, when you grow up and everybody's telling you you're fat all the time. And again, like I'm talking about teachers and stuff like that, you know, like I got it from every angle. Um when everybody's telling you that you're fat and it's happening all the time, you start having to be like really open and, and straightforward about it. Cause you can't hide it. And so what that means is like, you start just having, you know, you just start having to have conversations openly about things that you don't necessarily like, like, because the, the thing about you, the thing about me that I felt like was the worst was so obvious and it was everybody else's business that I had to talk about it all the time. And like, I could, if I fought with people who called me fat or talked about my weight, I was going to be fighting all the time. So I had to learn to like, not give a shit when people talked about my stuff, which made me more willing to like, and a lot less judgmental about talking about other people's stuff. I feel like, because I mean, the worst thing about me in my mind was front and center. You know, the thing that I struggled with the most the thing that everybody told me was my biggest problem was so front and center. It was so everybody's business that when somebody else shares something that, that 
they struggle with, I feel like I'm more willing to be like, oh, okay, cool. And I mean, honestly, on some level, a lot of that was like, because in a lot of my life, I'm like, well, I would trade being fat for that. So like, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm not judgmental about what you have because what you have is not as bad as what I have. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, that's what it felt like, you know, that's what it felt yeah. like. Um, so I think, I think that's part of it. And, you know, I just, I don't know, especially once I started getting an OA and stuff like that, I wasn't going to come into those rooms and be like, you know, I'm struggling with my weight, but I'll, the rest of you guys are freaks. Uh, you know, like <laughs> I wasn't going to be, you know, um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I generally think people are trying and trying the best they can. And it's being super honest about stuff and being able to hold space for other people to be super honest about what's going on with them has been pretty important for me. So, you know. Yeah. Well, and I'm so glad you're willing to tell your story and your perspective today because I think it's one that is really hard to listen to and not have a really deep well of compassion for. Um, So I'm like so grateful that you take the time to do this um, from my little podcast. And I also think that you know, I know you don't say that you have an eating disorder and I, I believe you and, you know, but I do think there's a lot of gray maybe in it, which is like, that's the whole deal, right? Like the whole podcast is called gray maybe because I don't really feel like I ever really qualify in whatever I'm going through. Everything's a little gray and everything's kind of a maybe. Um, so I also love your story for that because I do feel like it's really in alignment. So Dave, thank you for coming and talking with me. I guess it's tonight when we're recording this, but for lending your time and your talent and also for being um, really, really raw and sharing the truth. Thank you. And it was super great. I appreciate you thinking of me and bringing me to this. It's great. The minute I decided to do a second season of Grey Maybe and have the topic be about the body, I thought of Dave. His story and his path was not at all black or white, and although he and I have very different situations with our bodies, I still feel like I relate to a lot of his experiences and feelings. Dave doesn't even feel like he fits in the category of an eating disorder, and I would never argue with him, because even if he doesn't fit the criteria for this podcast topic entirely, I think his story is important to tell and for people to hear. The more I talk on this podcast about the body, the more it's become clear it's so much about the mind. My hope is that people who don't experience life in a larger body can awaken to how someone who does experiences life differently. My hope is also to include all different body types and experiences in this season. I think someone's experience can be relatable even if it's not the same as your own. And I think everyone's journey is so uniquely their own. No one person's advice, suggestion, or experience could possibly be the solution for someone else. I'm so honored to know Dave and to call him my friend. And also so thankful he was willing to tell his story heartfeltly and honestly. I hope you found something that resonated in my conversation with Dave today. If you're listening to this episode and you're realizing you are more like Dave or myself than not, welcome, and I hope this helps you take a step in the direction of recovery if you haven't already. You're not alone. Just a reminder, for anyone who needs to hear it, you don't need to wait until you're sick enough to get help. In fact, you don't have to be sick at all, just a desire to feel a little better. If you're listening and right now you're struggling with an eating disorder, disordered eating, or other behaviors, welcome. Know that whatever you're feeling, there are those among us that have probably felt it too. You're not alone. If you're listening because you have someone you love in your life that is suffering or is in recovery for an eating disorder, welcome. You are also not alone. Even having an eating disorder myself, I have not reacted the best I could to others who were struggling before my own recovery. I've attached to do's and don'ts of how to deal with someone suffering in the show notes as well as how to contact Dave and myself and various links for help and recovery when and if you're ready. If you've made it this far, thank you so much for listening, and I hope you were able to find something relatable in today's episode. 
As I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, this is also a social experiment to see if in telling my story, I can embolden listeners to share their stories. If you'd like me to read your recovery story on this topic, anonymous or otherwise, on the podcast, please email graymaybestories at gmail.com. G-R-E-Y-M-A-Y-B-E-S-T-O-R-I-E-S at gmail.com. Thank you to everyone who helped make this Gray Maybe podcast happen. Producer and editor, Roderick Barge. Cover photo by Jose Perez. Music licensed by Pixabay. Special counsel, Jada Ellingham and Roderick Barge. Special shout out to supporter, Patty Olgan. If you'd like to support this podcast, please rate, share, comment, and subscribe. Until next time, bye for now.